everybody. My name is Dr. Rob Silverman. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm excited to talk about the strategies for applying epigenetics in your practice. I will share some proven protocols for clinical success. Now, um, my background real simply is I'm a chiropractor who uses a lot of functional medicine. I'm an Amazon best-selling author and ACA Sports Council chiropractor the year 2015. And I do appreciate everybody taking time, whether it be live or Memorex, to come join us on this webinar. Epigenetics has burst onto the scene as an essential area for many practitioners to understand. Yet savvy practitioners are struggling to understand the role of epigenetics that plays in their patient's health. Epigenetics explains how a gene's expression can be turned on and off through the interaction with environmental surroundings. Some of these surroundings include smoking, mismatched diets, air pollution, stress, lack of sleep, and more. I'm gonna break down some different genetic panels and explore the role epigenetics plays in activating key SNPs. I will talk about implementing epigenetic protocols. That's gonna be one of my biggest takeaways. We're gonna spend a large amount of time on protocols, and I'm also gonna discuss the idea of personalization to a specific level so we can decrease the trial and error and save the patient time and money and increase our outcomes. It was once said, your genetics load the gun, but the lifestyle will pull the trigger. Your DNA is not your destiny. We've heard that. That means genes may load the gun, as I said earlier, but to be even more specific, the environmental factors will pull the trigger. Environment, especially for those with chronic illness like type 2 diabetes, arthritis, heart disease, cancer. The true translation is genes are your potential, but require a certain environment in order to be expressed. So what really determines health and disease for most of us? It is not genetics. When people come in and say to you that, you know, my genes are to be heavy, my genes are to be this, it's really only 10% and most possibly up to 30%. 70 to 90% is lifestyle, environment, and biochemistry. 70 to 90% is your choice, which leads you down a path of chronic disease. Let's look at genetics overview. Genetics looks at the mechanism of action at the gene level, which would include chromosomes, DNA, genes, and polymorphisms, which is really only about 1% of the population. The polymorphisms is really where it gets very, very interesting. So let's take a look. When you look at this level, if you will, of DNA, you see what we call a SNP, a single nuclear polymorphism. Most, the impact of SNPs, most have no impact. Most SNPs truly have no effect on health or development. Some of these genetic differences, however, have been proven to be very important in the study of human health. Researchers have found that SNPs that may help predict an individual's response to certain drugs, susceptibility to environmental factors such as toxins, and even an individual's response to nutrients and exercise. Real question is, what are we looking at? Where do we want to get to? Well, there's symptoms, there's lab values, there's epigenetics, there's their DNA. I always say that symptoms are a sign that something's wrong with the system. When you treat just symptoms, you're basically putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. The real question is, is there a better way to know before the symptoms start? So maybe it's DNA, epigenetics, lab values, and just a small amount of symptoms. DNA is interesting in that we know it's the blueprint of our life. So let's take a little time with epigenetics. Number one, what is epigenetics? Epigenetics is the feedback loop between our genes and the environment. Our cells are constantly updating our genes on what they need to thrive. By inputting the correct environmental variables for genes, food is included, we can create health, longevity, and leave beneficial epigenetic marks for the next generation. So epigenetics, once again, changes to our DNA that changes the expression of methylation, histone modification, and microRNA. Epigenetics is the study of DNA modifications like we talked about that does not change the DNA sequence but can affect gene activity. 
chemical compounds that are added to single genes can regulate their activities. These modifications are known as epigenetic changes. The epigenome comprises all of the chemical compounds that have been added to the entirety of one's DNA genome as a way to regulate the activity expression of all the genes within the genome. The chemical compounds of the epigenome are not part of the DNA sequence, but are on or attached to DNA. Epigenetic modifications remain as cells divide and in some cases can be inherited through the generations. So the real question is take a good look. How does this happen? How can two mice with the same DNA sequence have different coat colors? Epigenetics. In this particular mouse strain, when a mom is given a diet enriched in folic acid, which is a good source, as you all know, for epigenetic methylation of DNA, a gene controlling coat color is methylated, resulting in more brown pups being born than yellow. This is an example of how diet can cause epigenetic changes to affect an individual without physically changing the DNA sequence. So for me, this study presented a valuable model and underlines the influence of outside factors on gene expression. So external events are very important in your epigenetic outcomes. How about the two twin in the astronauts? This was a landmark study where a group of US scientists studied the difference between the epigenomes of astronaut Scott Kelly, who spent a year in space, and his twin brother Mark, who remained on Earth. The research team examined two types of white blood cells, CD4 and CD8, isolated from Mark and Scott's blood. They focused on epigenetic marks consisting of chemical modifications called methyl groups that are added onto the DNA in a process which we call methylation. Overall, they found that just as many epigenetic changes occurred in the earthbound Mark's DNA as in, in his space flying twin. There was less than a 5% difference in overall methylization between the twins during the mission. The largest difference occurred nine months into the mission when 79% of Scott's DNA was methylated compared with 83% of Mark's. So what's most interesting is the data from other researchers involved in this current study who found increases in biochemical markers associated with inflammation in Scott, but not Mark. They changed their environment. They had different outcomes. And let's take a look at the twin study. And I'm just trying to build some background so everybody understands what tests, why, and then we're gonna talk about protocols and share them with you. So you have a Monday morning application. My goal always when I lecture, whether it be virtual or in person, is to take the science and bridge it to Monday morning application. So now let's look at a classic example of twins. Identical twins are born with the exact same DNA, and yet by adulthood, it is entirely possible and likely they will turn out quite different, even in traits that have a strong genetic compound. For example, twin A might engage in behaviors that will negatively impact her health. Let's say throughout her life, she rarely, if ever, engages in physical activity, smokes a pack of cigarettes each day, and has really bad dietary habits. At age 55, her doctor has just informed her that she has high blood pressure and recommends medications to lower it because she's at a risk for cardiovascular disease. Meanwhile, twin B, again with the same starting point DNA, has exercised almost every day through her life, eats predominantly a plant-based healthy diet, and is mindful of her stress levels, engaging in things like meditation and yoga. She just completed a marathon, and a goal she set for her 55th birthday was just given a clean bill of health at a last annual checkup. The difference in the health of the two women cannot be explained by genetic differences. They both have the same genetic predispositions. The answer can be found within epigenetics, which again, studies how DNA interacts with smaller molecules and cells to impact gene expression. This interaction is highly influenced by one's environment and lifestyle choices. So this picture really gives a great example of same environment, different outcomes. You boil the potatoes, it gets soft. You boil the eggs, they get hard. Power of genetics. You're driving. You can only see what's ahead. You have a blind spot on your left and you have a blind spot on your right. So let's talk about some examples of epigenetic effects. Stress can be very deleterious to your epigenetics. Diet, sleep. 
you know, it's so funny how we talk about sleep. Sleep is so overlooked in a functional functional medicine armamentarium. Toxins. We live in a toxic world. We will have a detox uh, panel that we're going to go over. Environmental exposure. Environmental exposure is taking the world by storm. Air pollution has just shown to increase the incidence of diabetes by 15%. Whether you exercise, what kind of exercise, how long do you exercise? Light and dark, without question, your microbiome. 80% 80% of your immune cells are in your gut. It's where your macro and micronutrients are absorbed. For me, your gut, your microbiome is the epicenter of your health. So changes to your microbiome will really lead you down a path of epigenetic changes. MTHFR, folate versus folic acid. Goodness gracious. Without question, this is one of the largest conversation pieces that we have in the idea of genes, methylation, and epigenetics. So let me take a moment and go over what the role is of MTHFR in the body. It's no MTHFR plays an essential role in one carbon metabolic pathway and the methylation cycle by converting folic and folic acid into the active form of folate. The methylation cycle consists of multiple biochemical steps that are involved in adding methyl groups to various molecules, including DNA, RNA, and even some proteins. Additionally, this methylization process is active in most of the cells and is an essential component of many of the body's metabolic reactions. In addition to converting different forms of folate we consume into energy, the methylation cycle functions as a component in numerous pathways, such as neurotransmitter synthesis, cognitive function, immune function, inflammatory response, DNA protection and regulation, as well as cardiovascular health, and believe it or not, overall healthy aging. So many people ask me, docs and patients alike, what can affect MTHFR activity? Well, while the methylation cycle may be affected by numerous factors, such as drug and alcohol use, exposure to heavy metals, environmental toxins, A bad diet because you're you're losing cofactors and specific B vitamins is the most common cause of impaired methylation due to variations in the MTHFR gene, known as a SNP. The MTHFR enzyme is the rate-limiting step of methylation cycle and decreases MTHFR activity, which will greatly impact downstream reactions as well as contribute to the buildup of potentially harmful molecules such as homocysteine. Here, please make note, it is estimated that 85% of the general population has one MTHFR SNP variant that typically impacts this methylation process. The most widely known MTHFR SNP polymorphism includes RS1801133, the C677T mutation, and R180. 1131, the A129T mutation. So these are the most common mutations. We could do a whole webinar on MTHFR if need be. And without question, this is one of the first and most common starting points. So some of the possible effects of MTHFR. The gene mutation may increase the risk of learning disorders, mood disorders, fibromyalgia, neurodegeneration, heart disease, digestive problems, addictive behaviors, Down syndrome, autoimmunity, and chronic fatigue, many of the things that we're seeing in our office every day. Folate. So here you have what I I took from one of my friend's um, panels. And if anybody's interested at the end, please feel free to ask. I'm happy to share where they can get these panels. And I've got a little code for you. Uh, Nutrition optimization. There's your folate. So people with similar genetic markers may be predisposed to folate deficiencies. So these are from Da Vinci. I recommend, these are the three options that I recommend as a protocol from Da Vinci, which you can start with your strep, stress, sorry, stress B capsules, one cap per meal. Um, it contains the active form of vitamin B12. It also has a brand folate L5 MTHFR, which is highly bioavailable form of folic acid, 
stress B contains B1, B2, B3, B6, folic acid, B12, biotin, panathetic acid, PAPA, choline, and inositol to support proper nerve function and relaxation. The vitamin B complex in stress B helps manage stress, support immune function, and helps reduce irritability. As we all know, B vitamins are important for proper circulatory function, for maintaining blood pressure within normal ranges, and preserving proper cholesterol and homocysteine levels. Then the other option, the, the first two are definites. So stress B capsules and this other one I recommend, which is active folate B12 chewable. Um, the chewable has the most stable bioavailable active form of folate in B12. It's recommended for methylation, cellular health, childbearing years, et cetera. So the preferred form of folate for the support of homocysteine management heart health and nerve function, and all the products that are mentioned are vegan and gluten-free. The Glutaronic DMG is an interesting product because it is a dietary supplement to support the immune system, circulatory, neurological functions, muscle recovery, and endurance. So this is my MTHFR protocol. So here's a panel that I use. This is a panel that I made up for a particular company. and What's most interesting is that it's called the Dr. Rob, of course, musculoskeletal panel. So there are traits that you're looking at. You're looking at injury risk and a disc degeneration. You're looking at vitamin C. You're looking at uh, vitamin D, muscle damage, magnesium, and musculoskeletal pain. The musculoskeletal panel, why is it that some people appear to sprain their ankle every few months while others rarely experience injury or pain? Is it just the proprioception or the lack of proprioception that makes the ankle sprain the highest recurring sports injury? This panel will help you support your athlete, your weekend warrior, or even your sedentary patient who's now interested in doing more exercise, i.e. some proprioceptive work. So epigenetic influences for this panel, exercise, exercise type, recovery, nutrition, pain. Your genetics can dictate the type of muscle fibers you have, your predisposition to disc degeneration, even nutritional deficiencies. These nutritional deficiencies are important to understand and nutrients such as collagen, vitamin C, vitamin D3, and others help repair muscles, ligaments, and reduce inflammation. One of the most fascinating aspects of the panel is helping your patients understand the type of muscle fiber they have. Many patients patients develop injuries because they choose an exercise that does not match their muscle fiber. People with fast twitch muscles are prone to overextending their ligaments and experience more injuries when they participate in long distance runs versus shorter sprints. In contrast, people with slow twitch muscles will experience increased benefits in body composition when they participate in endurance, lightweight, or longer duration type exercise. Knowing these differences are key to help you support your patient in an ideal fitness journey. Healing is a process. I have a computer in every room. I use this slide all the time. Let's just take a quick look at a pristine muscle on the left. Pre-injury, healthy tissue. You get a damaged tissue, an injured tissue. Let's look at the strained tissue. It's not going to move. It's not going to extend. It's not going to close. It's going to start to have some imprecation on nerves, arteries, and vein. Look at the healed injured tissue, healed with scar tissue. Scar tissue left on the muscle after healing restricts the muscle fibers, nerves, and vessels causing pain and leaving the muscle less flexible. How about pain? How is pain or how centralized pain develops? Well, you get injured peripheral nerves or brain. You get chemical or electronic signals that enter the central nervous system microglial activation, which leads to neuroinflammation, which can rele release excess glutamate neurotoxins, leading you to cell death, apoptosis, and imprinting of pain sensation. So essentially, pain is memory in your central nervous system. So here's my musculoskeletal panel. Here's one that I use every day in my office, and I recommend these specific da Vinci products. CX Solution. It's an advanced formula to help with joint comfort, flexibility, elasticity, synovial fluid varicosity, connective tissue health, hydration, mobility, and muscle functions. So the solution combines sea cucumber, glucosamine, hyaluronic acid, and MSM to support the joint structure and function. Curcumin, boswellia, quercetin, and DMG also supports joint comfort. 
It's a very synergistic combination of well-recognized nutrients that may be beneficial for those that experience joint and muscle discomfort and or if you're losing some joint mobility and elasticity. So that's my go-to, that's my starting point, three caps a day. Ends Flame, one scoop daily, is a dietary supplement that actually combines 13 ingredients that work, again, I love the word synergistically, to support comfort, mobility, and flexibility. It was designed originally to help support the body with general aches and pains, relief associated with physical activity, and overexertion, making it exceptional for everyday support. So it's good for, again, mobility, range of motion, flexibility, muscle, and joint discomfort. And Phytocan Omega, an omega-3, obviously supports joint mobility, endurance, methylation, and immune support. It has a very unique omega fatty acid source of perna oil. And this is formulated in a highly concentrated CO2 extracted oil, which contains a complex of 30 different fatty acids, more than any other omega fatty acid source in the world. So that is, I like to do in the power of three, if I can, that is my musculoskeletal protocol for the panel that we just meant. Now, I always like to assess, testing, not guessing, get a baseline, add a treatment and include supplements that are needed. APOE4, I would have to say that this is the number one test that I do in my office. So let's go through this. We don't have number two there. There's APO2, there's APO3, and there's APO4. APO2 means you're really in good condition. Very few people have this. The APOE4 is one that causes a lot of issues and increases your incidence precipitously towards Alzheimer's. So I happen to be the first one, I'm a 3-3. So as long as I keep my lifestyle uh, appropriate and my environment good, I should not have any Alzheimer's conditions. 3-4 or 4-4 leads you down a path of uh, detrimental health and strong possibilities of Alzheimer's. So of course, you can test for your APOE4 on your Alzheimer's cognitive panel. I put all these panels together. So I, I put an Alzheimer's panel together. I put my Dr. Rob uh, concussion panel together. It's ideal for any patients who are worried about cognitive decline, patients who participate in contact sports, or patients who want to protect their brain. So let's look at some of the epigenetic influences, omega-3 levels, omega-3 intake, nutrition, smoking, alcohol, and exercise. We know that certain people experience more profound recovery when they have a concussion compared to others, and much of the explanation ties back to their genes. For example, there are certain genes that code for cytokines like interleukin-6 or TN-alpha that can increase the inflammatory response in our body. When we experience a concussion, the brain will have an inflammatory response. If our inflammatory genes are activated, we may have a more profound reaction to concussion, such increased swelling, dizziness, or difficulty concentrating. We all know about the APOE4. This is also in these epigenetic influences. And the third one, these are all three I like to get do together. This is my Dr. Rob's gut to brain uh, panel. Gut brain, we know that the gut and the brain are intimately intertwined and our gut health affects our brain health. Our brain health affects our gut health. The gut brain panel investigates the following conditions that have been shown to affect either our gut or our brain health, like inflammation, celiac, concussion, irritable bowel, gluten sensitivity, lactose intolerance, and more. So epigenetic influencers. So what I'm showing you is a test and what would be an influencer within this test in this genre. When our gut is inflamed, either through a condition like IBS or provoked by allergic food or food sensitivity like gluten, our GI tract is compromised and cannot break down or absorb nutrients optimally. Make our neurotransmitters a neurotransmitter like serotonin. All of this leads to the obvious answer, leaky gut. New studies have found that those who have a leaky gut may also have a leaky blood-brain barrier. This means a tightly sealed blood-brain barrier can let bacteria or inflammatory markers into the brain. Additionally, several studies have shown that the types of bacteria that we have in our gut can affect our mood. So once again, if anybody knows me and they see me lecture, I'm all about the gut to brain axis. Here, let's talk about the APOE4 because I recommend if you're not taking a test, this is one test that you should start. The E4 isomer 
results in reduced growth and branching of neurons into vitro and seems to have an important play an important part in the neuronal response to injury. APOE4 is actually a gene on chromosome 19. It, and we talked about the three main focuses, the numbers of the APO2, three and four. Please make note, the APO4 is 25 to 30% of the population. It is the most common Alzheimer's allele. APOE4 or APOE encodes the instructions for making protein that helps transport cholesterol and other types of fat in the bloodstream. The findings on APOE4 support a concept there is a reduced response to anti-dyslipidemia treatment in the E4 carriers, reinforces the usefulness of APO4 genotyping in predicting patient response to these horrific lipary lowering therapies. Interesting. Alzheimer's gene is linked to a higher risk of severe COVID-19. The researchers found when studied 383,000 European and ancestry, 9,000 positive for two copies of the E4 variant increased the risk of dementia by 14 times. In a one-month period, five-week period actually, positive COVID-19, 37 people positive with two E4, two times the risk of severe COVID-19. The takeaway in this May 2020 article was that the conclusion revealed the possible that the role of APOE4 in the immune system is important in the disease. Concussion is linked to brain changes in people at genetic risk for Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease, I can tell you this, before COVID came about, if you talk brain, you talked Alzheimer's, you captivated everybody's attention in the room. Alzheimer's, sixth leading cause of death in the US, seventh in the world, in a 15 year period, Heart disease or heart attacks decreased 11%. Alzheimer's death increased 123%. One in three seniors die from Alzheimer's and dementia. It kills more than breast and prostate cancer combined. In 2018, Alzheimer's and dementia cost 277 billion. By the year 2050, Alzheimer's dementia cost 1.1 trillion. Someone in the US develops the disease every 65 seconds. We all know people who have lived through cancer and heart attack. We still to date truly don't know very many people who've lived through Alzheimer's. Now, I love this slide in that this really talks about the disturbances of the brain-gut microbiota axis in Alzheimer's disease. Disturbances along the brain-gut microbiota axis include the central nervous system and the enteric nervous system which contribute to the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. The gut microbiota is known to upregulate local and systemic inflammation due to LPS, from pathogenic bacteria, and the synthesis of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Alterations in the gut microbiota composition may induce increased permeability of the intestinal barrier and the blood-brain barrier, further enhancing inflammation at the gut, systemic, and central nervous system levels. Ultimately, Amyloid beta formation takes place in the enteric nervous system and the central nervous system. In addition, a large amount of amyloids is secreted by the gut microbiota. I'm a big proponent of detoxing for cognitive decline. So this is a great option, something that we should put in our toolbox to help people avoid any kind of neurodegeneration. We have pathogens. You get an immune response in your body to toxins and antigens. You get an antibody production against pathogens and toxins. You now have antibodies binding to um, amyloid beta protein through cross reactivity, leading to amyloid plaque formation. Sleep, sleep and Alzheimer's. Sleep is when your brain can recover. Sleep is when you can detox your metabolic waste. You shrink your brain to 40% of its typical size, and that shrinking and squeezing like a sponge excretes all of your toxins and metabolic waste products. The study here found when young healthy men were deprived of just one night of sleep, they had higher levels of tau protein in their blood. There's a direct relationship between the glymphatic system function and brain states. 
Your lymphatic system is a system that once again enables you to have metabolic waste clearance. Head injuries, just like we talked about concussion, may lead to early Alzheimer's. Contact sports that can result in concussions, i.e. American football, lead to early onset Alzheimer's. Conclusions drawn by looking at post-mortem Alzheimer's cases. Alzheimer's onset could be accelerated by up to nine years. Now, when I said American football, that wasn't really fair. Soccer also has a large amount of concussions. The number one susceptible athlete to concussion is a female soccer player. Take a good look at this. Concussions, genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's, gut to brain, et cetera, can all lead us down a path of having a damage or damaging structure called our brain. Our brain is out of order. Now, interesting about a brain, it is made of the consistency of jello. Jello, it's three pounds. That's all it is. Yet it's three pounds, it uses 25% of our metabolic energy intake and it gets 25% of the freshly oxygenated blood. It is the most toxic, stress vulnerable organ in our body. We cannot live without this three pound organ. Five measures that lower Alzheimer's risk. Five behaviors associated with lower risk for Alzheimer's disease. Number one, exercise. Number two, not smoking. Three, moderate drinking. Four, Mediterranean diet, and five, mentally stimulating activities. I'd like to say that I'd like to put another one in there. I know this was from a July 2020 study. The Mediterranean diet is great. A, another diet that I found to be extraordinarily effective to help avoid neurodegenerative disease is the ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet, 75% fat, 20% protein, 5% carbohydrates. I recommend what I call the clean keto which is not using any processed food and avoiding dairy. I found that the ketogenic diet makes ketone bodies, great fuel for the brain. Also the release of a ketone body called beta hydroxybutyrate imbues the brain with a lot of fuel and energy. I'm a big proponent on these five and a few more that the more that you follow them, the lower your Alzheimer's risk is. Those five measures that lower Alzheimer's, let's look at the database used. 1,845 patients, average age of 23, 920 patients, average age 81, all free of Alzheimer's are to start, filed for an average of six years, 608 developed Alzheimer's disease. Those two or three healthy lifestyle factors, if you follow that, get a 37% reduction in risk. If those who follow four or five of the healthy lifestyle factors, that is 60% reduction of risk. So the conclusion is obvious. The more lifestyle changes that you make, the more you adhere to a good quality lifestyle, decrease incidence of Alzheimer's. Here is an overview of biological mechani mechanisms underlying cognitive gains with physical activity and exercise. The bottom line is pick the type of exercise you want. You'll have increased growth factors if you exercise, decreased inflammatory markers, increased cardiovascular and cerebrovascular health, a decrease on stress hormones, and the bottom line is improved cognitive performance, increased attention, processing speed, executive function, and memory. Sleep and Alzheimer's, once again, I wanted to reiterate this a second time. When young, healthy men were deprived of one night of sleep, they had higher levels of tau biomarker for Alzheimer's proteins when they had a full night's rest. We all, all need a better night's sleep. Omega-3s, and I'm going to discuss with you, it's called brain benefits, a great omega-3 needed to provide brain benefits. 33 participants had Alzheimer's risk factors. 15 of those had the APOE4 gene. The treatment group took two grams of DHA. Control group took a placebo. Researchers gathered samples of the blood plasma, cerebral spinal fluid, and tested for EPA and DHA. After six months, patients who took omega-3s had 200% more DHA in the blood and 28% more in the cerebral spinal fluid. The takeaway is blood plasma levels may not indicate how much is reaching the brain. Those in a conclusion that were E4 carriers, despite having the same dose, have less omega-3s in the brain. Body weight, 
has a tremendous impact on brain function. Essentially, the conclusion here was the studies showed that overweight or obese seriously impacted brain activity and increased the risk for Alzheimer's disease, as well as many psychiatric and cognitive conditions. It's simple. As a person's weight goes up, all the regions of the brain go down in activity and blood flow. One of my more favorite studies, this really ties in how the gut and the brain are intertwined when you're looking at neurodegenerative disease. LPS is abundant in Alzheimer's disease. LPS activates toll-like receptor 2 and 4, leads to cytokine production, inflammation, and innate immune defense responses that can produce central nervous system pathology. This microbiome-derived neurotoxins play a strong role in shaping the human immune system and contributing to neurodegenerative disease. Here's some potential implications of toll-like receptors in the gut-to-brain axis. What's interesting in healthy subjects in this study, the gut epithelium is guaranteed by tight junctions between the cells. Toll-like receptors, which we talked about just before, which are actually receptor sites in the gut that can signal inflammatory uh, markers to release um, the NLRP3 inflammasome, which ultimately can release the NF-kappa B. Toll-like receptors are expressed on macrophages, dendrite cells, and intestinal epithelial cells serving as sentinels to monitor the pathogens in the gut. The vagus nerve appears to modulate communication between the gut and the brain. The whole microenvironment maintains in homostasis, but when you age, tight junctions of intestinal and blood-brain barriers unfortunately become more permeable. In Alzheimer's patients, the diversity of the gut microbiota decreased, while the population of pro-inflammatory bacteria increased. Bacteria in their excretions could cross the leaky gut and then activate toll-like receptors in the epithelium, leading to production of pro-inflammation cytokines. These cytokines make their way through the circulation of the vagus nerve to the brain, enlarge the neuroinflammatory response, and promote neurodegeneration in the central nervous system. Here is another example of the microbiome, LPS, going breaking through the gut GI barrier then getting through a already damaged blood-brain barrier. The gut barrier and the brain barrier are made up of the same proteins, single-layer epithelial cell with the thickness of a wet paper towel. Once they get in the blood-brain barrier, they can damage brain tissue, leading you down a path of Alzheimer's disease. From gut dysbiosis to Alzheimer's disease, the figure really depicts the possible pathogenic events associated with gut dysbiosis leading to peripheral and central pathogenic events, which would lead to the risk of AD. Gut, central nervous system, getting into the brain, Alzheimer's, dysbiosis, an unleveling of good and bad bacteria. Ah, one of my more favorite slides. I use this in all my talks, the Dr. Rob's Gut Matrix. In the interest of time, let me give you an epigrammatic overview of what this is. Everybody on this webinar should know what leaky gut is. So we all know that we should have a semi-permeable gut. A leaky gut means that we have a permeable gut. That's either the gut or the epithelial level or the tight junctions are injured. Food sensitivities can cause or be a byproduct of leaky gut. Leaky gut syndrome can lead to an excessive amount of yeast fungus and what we just talked about before, dysbiosis and that unleveling of good and bad bacteria. LPS which is an endotoxin, can now be released. Endotoxin leads you down on a damaging path for damage to specific joints. The excessive amount of toxins that flow in the bloodstream go to the liver, which now lead to liver dysfunction or toxic chemical overload. Leaky gut also increases your incidence of blood sugar problems, insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, body composition, i.e. obesity. Leaky gut increases your incidence of autoimmunity, hence the idea of Hashimoto's in this particular discussion. Leaky gut, LPS, leaky heart, three times the incidence of leaky heart when LPS is released. Leaky gut can lead you down a path of increased musculoskeletal faults. Cytokines, inflammatory cytokines can be released, and MMPSs, matrix metalloproteinases, your body's own proteolytic enzymes, also can damage specific fibrocartilage structures like discs, rotator cuff, and the like. And last but not least, gut to brain, brain to gut, leaky gut, 
increasing your inflammatory neurodegeneration in the brain. So factors affecting the gut microbiota composition. Interesting in that here we've got host health and immune function, neurotransmitters and metabolites, your diet, no surprise, your environmental influence, and your genetic predisposition. When you look at your microbiome, other than your genetics, everything else you control. We all don't have to run around with a leaky gut. It's just a bad excuse, if you will, not one that I'd like to adhere to. I do leaky gut. I, I just stopped with a whole bunch of patients, some were chiropractic, some were nutrition, the gut and gut health and tests I've talked about with all my patients so far today. Strategies to alter gut microbiota, fecal microbiota transplants involves a transfer of fecal microbiota from a donor to another individual. Alternatively, um, targeted formations can be used to augment host microbiota. We'll talk about them in a moment. Diet prebiotics and postbiotics can influence the microbiota community. Good question. If someone asks what a postbiotic is, it's coming out in my upcoming book in 2021. You have to feed a probiotic. Probiotic is uh, pro-life. You do that with a prebiotic. What's left behind is essentially your postbiotic, the residue. Here's one of the cutest slides that I like. You take your history. You look at what can cause leaky gut. Well, antibiotic or NSAID use, mercury fillings or heavy metals, TBI, concussion, cesarean birth, gut dysbiosis, hormone imbalance, chronic inflammation, vitamin and nutrient deficiencies, your diet. Gluten, which means glue, dairy, sugar, nightshades, an unleveling of omega-6 and omega-3 ratios, industrial seed oils like vegetable oils, no such thing. And your lifestyle, without question, liver toxicity, stress, alcohol consumption, sleep deprivation, and of course, environmental toxins. A food additive impacts uh, gut bacteria, an emulsifier. These food additives are very damaging to your overall gut health. And we should avoid them as much as we can. Gut bacteria actually influences depression. It's interesting in that we're now, with the idea of the gut to brain communicating, we understand that the bacteria is really our controller. The question is, is our bacteria crazy or are we crazy when we say somebody's crazy? And that's like a half-hearted joke, if you will. The gut to brain connection, getting to the root cause of the broken brain. The gut to brain, 400 times the amount of messages from the gut to the brain than the brain to the rest of the body, over a thousand species, three pounds of bacteria in your gut, trillions of bacteria in the gut, 20 million bacteria genes, 2000 genes in humans. There's more bacteria than cells in your body and the gut contains more neurotransmitters than your brain. Your gut, so we all know, produces vitamins, digests foods, regulates hormones, excretes toxins, produces healing compounds. So to treat the brain, you must remove the cause of inflammation, which is leaky gut. Here's a great representation of the gut to brain inflammation. The takeaway here is in the interest of time, a high percentage of abnormal intestinal permeability, i.e. leaky gut, were found with patients with autism and their relatives. Autism. Higher levels of autism if the mom has leaky gut, they're cesarean born, and if the child has leaky gut. In a future webinar, I hope to go into detail on that particular subject. Exercise influences the microbiome in the gut to brain axis. Aerobic exercise has shown to improve diversity the most. You want diversity. The diversity in your gut is your superpower to health. This particular uh, PowerPoint su summarizes the different factor detriments, which have been mentioned through the, this particular webinar. The link that the gut microbiota is with the gut to brain axis in the development of obesity. These include a change in the microbiota composition, increased LPS concentrations, culminating in an increase in gut permeability and chronic low grade inflammation, as well as an increase in energy intake and a decrease in energy expenditure. The microbiota gut to brain axis, really hammering this point. As we know, it's bi directional. All can be impacted by or impacting, if you will, food intake, 
cognitive behavior, stress, social interaction, fear, positives, exercise, negatives, drugs, environment, good or bad, the mode of delivery, we talked about it, genetics and epigenetics, and of course your diet. So the gut to brain axis, a very, very interesting conversation. We've been talking about it. Bidirectional signaling between the GI and the central nervous system occurs through spinal afferents and the vagus nerve. This mode of communication is thought to occur through peptides as well as neurotransmitters. Human and animal studies of various disease demonstrate that these two systems are not exclusive of one another, but do in fact show some parallels in terms of expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines and altered physiological functions. So let me give you the takeaway. Intestinal permeability leads to systemic bacterial toxins, blood-brain barrier permeability leading to neuroautoimmune reactivity. So the takeaway here is if you can prevent the damage to your gut, you probably can prevent mucosal immune abnormalities, imbalanced gut flora, intestinal barrier dysfunction, systemic inflammation, leading to neuroinflammation, neuroinvasion, and neurodegeneration. So you can prevent this whole cascade. So let's talk about and take a few minutes on my recommendations on the Alzheimer's to concussion to brain protocol that I recommend. So here's my Da Vinci products. Brain benefits, which um, one tablespoon daily, you could go up to two, not a problem. Promotes memory, learning, concentration, mood. Encourages a healthy immune response. As we all know, omega-3s, a high liquid omega-3s is great for heart, joints, hair, skin, nails, and brain. Omega-3 fatty acids are super concentrated in the brain, our fattiest organ. They can do wonders for our cognitive function, especially memory, focus, and mood. DHA and EPA help the brain learn new things with less effort. They may even change brain structure, making space for more brain cells. Omega-3 fatty acids protect the brain from wear and tear. So ultimately, it means you and your patients may think more clearly no matter what. As an aside, EPA and DHA are not just great for the brain. They promote heart health, comfort, joints, skin, hair, and nails, and Actually, they're excellent for body composition. Another product, because we're talking about Alzheimer's, amyloid benefits. So there's a certain kind of protein that we talked about called beta amyloid peptide clumps together to, to produce plaques. And amyloid benefits, we use PBC, pomegranate, shodan, ashwagandha. They all work together to promote healthy levels of these proteins. Ashwagandha supports brain cell repair and recovery improving cognitive performance and memory. You really want to shield your brain from everyday wear and tear. When, you're, when your brain is calm, cool, and collected like you are, your mind is at peak performance and your memory is sharper than ever. So many of the ingredients here help towards supporting normal beta amyloid plaque levels, promote cognitive performance, support memory and mood, help counteract that everyday oxidative stress in your brain, encourage a calm immune response, and it is all in this formula, highly bioactive ingredients. Neuro benefits is a dietary supplement to help support healthy neurological functions and memory. So it's an innovative formula, which includes ingredients that serve as the best nutrients and botanicals to support healthy neurological function and memory. So what the first three that I do, I mix brain benefits, amyloid benefits, and neuro benefits. Everybody knows that I'm a big proponent on the gut's impact on the brain. So I'm going to have GI benefits in many of the specific um, epigenetic issues and panels. So GI benefits is here for comprehensive support of GI health. It balances the immune system in the gut, strengthens and repairs the intestinal lining, promotes regular bathroom habits, and truly supports high levels of beneficial bacteria. So key ingredients in the GI benefits is glutamine, marshmallow, stop intestinal permeability, i.e. leaky gut, where a weakened intestinal wall allows unwanted substances into the bloodstream, leading you down a path of possible autoimmunity. Addressing leaky gut can balance the immune system, ward off food sensitivities, and ultimately improve your 
brain function. And last but not least, let's look at the probiotic. Bottom line in this probiotic, it's called Mega Probiotic ND50. It has 52.5 billion colony forming units. You call it a multitude of uh, different uh, probiotics in that it's got lactobacillus, acidophilus, rhamnosus, cassei, salvaris. l salvaris is great because it's known to help with tight junctions, bifidobactam, longum, and bifidum, streptococcus, thermophilus, and FOS, a good quality probiotic. So here is your Alzheimer's concussion brain protocol. Gut health. So in gut health, as we get towards the finish line, once again, we're going to talk about the GI benefits to help overall leaky gut. Um, we're going to talk about um, mega probiotic ND50, which we talked about 52.5 uh, particular uh, colony forming units. Mega probiotic for her, I'm actually going to detail in the detox. And then here we have interesting when I talk about it, the liquid D3 10,000. We all know why we want D3. D3 is the most versatile, uh, health-promoting, should be called hormone D, not vitamin D. It's a great help for overall musculoskeletal health, good for the brain, great for concussion, and excellent for gut health because there's vitamin D receptors in your gut. And Clear GI, another product that I recommend that you add. You mix these together, you've got a potent gut health protocol. The detox panel. The detox panel offers an analysis of 17 traits and 27 genes, providing insight into a client's or a patient's inability to lose weight, increase fatigue or mood regularity, skin issues, difficulty breaking down estrogens and eliminating toxins. The panel investigates many gene families that are involved in everyday detox, estrogen, metabolism, glutathione, acetylization, plus many other detoxification genes. Toxins may affect epigenetics through multiple generations. The popular herbicide Roundup, which has glyphosate in it, can damage you for multiple generations. Let's avoid the use of gly glyphosate. Let's avoid the consumption of glyphosate. So here are your traits. As you can see, there's a plethora of things. This detox one is excellent. I'm a big proponent of detox. Remember, there's a gut to liver gut to liver and liver to gut to brain axis. There's more macrophages in your liver than any other body part. The liver has many different functions. It works in the body like an oil filter works in a car. The thyroid hormone T4 is converted to the more powerful form of T3 in the liver. The liver regulates stored sugar via gluconeogenesis. This process converts excess sugar to fat and cholesterol. Stored sugar in the liver is called glycogen. It is important that the liver cannot convert this back to glucose effectively. It is actually, I, I think I just said that wrong. It is very important that it can. I apologize. Let me restate. The liver can convert this back to glucose effectively. Bile is the major route of eliminating cholesterol. Bile also carries out toxins broken down by the liver. And last but not least, the big takeaway is Improper removal of estrogen can cause an estrogen dominant syndrome. This can lead with females to PMS, hot flashes, period difficulties, and much, much more. So always remember how well our body detoxifies determines our susceptibility to disease. If we take in toxins quicker than our body can rid of them, we're in trouble. Toxic overload is a silent killer. The sick body cannot rally itself if it's busy detoxifying pesticides and other chemicals. Let's not forget, your liver is your third brain. Your brain is your first brain. Your gut is your second brain. It has its own enteric nervous system. It has its own nervous system. And your liver is your third brain. It's extraordinarily vital. Here, without question, is a picture of the liver. And in the interest of time, just take a look at all that's going on inside the liver. The reason I put this up is not so you can memorize it. You can Google it too. I put it up for the simple reason there's a lot going on. So when you hear people say, I'm doing a juice detox, I'm doing a fruit detox, I'm doing a 500 calorie detox, all these things are not going to allow for the bifunctionality and the needed nutrients and energy to allow the liver to detoxify appropriately. There are six pathways in phase two. There's a phase one and phase two, the liver split in half. 
These pathways are of note. There's a cortisol pathway. There's an aspirin pathway. There's a glutathione, the master antioxidant pathway. There's a acetylation pathway. There's an amino acid and methylation estrogen. Estrogen is detoxed in the liver. Two of the pathways help to detox estrogen. The body's natural detoxification pathways to eliminate harmful chemicals and toxins may benefit from additional support. Here is my recommendation for additional support. We've already talked about the GI benefits. We've already talked about mega pro probiotic ND50. So I always do the gut with a detox plan. That's why GI benefits is so versatile. Why am I using a probiotic? Because if you want to truly, truly detox, probiotics enable you to help the detoxification pathways, remove heavy metals, and also allow estrogen not to get recleaved and go back, allow it to get flushed out through the stool. Some new products on the DaVinci Protocol line, enzyme benefits. As we all know, there's a mold, this, this has a comprehensive formula, including the broad range of enzymes, amylase, lipase, trypsin, pepsin, cellulase, invertase, pectinase, and more. Enzymes are protein-based compounds that function as catalysts to initiate and regulate the biochemical process necessary for life. Enzymatic reactions and pathways are critical in the liver for detoxification. So I'm a big proponent of six specific enzymes or six caps, uh, enzyme benefits, sorry, one per day, GI, one scoop, detox benefits. There is your functional, if you will, um, product that allows for phase one, phase two, and also stimulates phase three. Phase one and two occur in the liver, and phase three takes the toxin from the liver and dispenses with it. As I said before, there's a mega probiotic for her, and essentially it's 25 colony forming humic units that's specific to allow for balance and comfort for the female anatomy. And let's, le let's end with this. Toxic chemicals lead to a loss of immune tolerance, imbalanced microbiota and gut inflammation, loss of gut integrity, humoral and cell-mediated immune response, cross-reaction with various tissue antigens, the loss of the blood-brain barrier integrity, multiple organ tissue inflammation and immunity. Keep an eye out as we get to the end. Here's my book coming out in the first quarter of 2021. It's called The Superhighway to Health, Seven Steps to Optimizing the Gut-Brain Connection. I always like to end with a quote. Jim Rome, one of my fabs, said, take care of your body. It's the only place you have to live. Here's how you can get in touch with me. There's my website. Go for my Facebook, Instagram. Do a lot of social media. And I know we have a couple of quick ticks left just for some questions if you have any. Yeah, I'm going to come on here right now. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we had a lot of good questions and a lot of people joined us. So thank you, Dr. Silverman. Um, okay, so um, a couple of questions right off the bat were actually about, um, and is there any contradiction about the methylated B12 and folate? No, there is not. Great question. That protocol has been tried and true. I use it in my office. So the answer to the question is no. Okay, and then also, I guess, kind of along those lines is how can we explain to our clients why not to use folic acid? <laughs> you know, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I hate not to be forthright with my patients. I just try and explain to them folate is a better choice for absorption and methylation is a key process and folate instills methylation. It's very funny how methylation the practitioners are just on that. And it's it's very valuable. But one real important um, caveat is if you can't methylate and you haven't given a methylated B vitamins, the inability to methylate will lead you down a path of tight junction damage. Okay. Um, and then a couple more questions, I guess, on some recommendations. Uh, the first one was, do you recommend a clean ketogenic diet for those with elevated LDL and increased risk for cardiac disease? Yeah, I do. A, a clean keto means uh, no dairy. 
So instead of butter, it's clarified butter and ghee. It's not that processed food. So I have some articles that I've read that says that the ketogenic diet does not over a long term raise the cardiovascular. Now, I don't have everybody to hear to a keto diet. I don't think that a keto diet is for everybody. But if you want to talk about genes, there are specific panels that I use that let me know if you can absorb saturated fat at a high level. I am relatively low body fat for my age. Those who know me know that I'm a little meticulous, yet I don't do well with saturated fats. So with that being said, the ketogenic diet may not be right for me. Okay. Um, the next kind of question, I think you touched on it a bit. Um, what prebiotic and probiotic specific supplements do you tend to recommend? I think you talked about the Da Vinci products. Um, right. I don't know if you want to kind of re... Absolutely. The mega probiotic ND50 is the choice. It's a great choice. It's got 15.5 colony forming units. Um, we had a lot of questions too, I think, about you know getting the recording after and um, about you sharing some of your resources or like you said, you had um, you were able to share the panels that you ha were speaking of at the beginning of the presentation. Right. Um, so there are people who want to have access. Did, did they want access to the panels? Is that what they're asking? Yes. Okay. Well, Everybody, I, I will send it to you, but it is Toolbox Genomics and put in the code Dr. Rob and they will give you a discount on your first purchase. Toolbox Genomics, Dr. Rob. And okay. um, if you email me now, I'll send that to you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and your email's on the screen there or your Correct. website. And Right, and email's easy. Info at Dr. Rob Silver, Dr. Robert Silverman, excuse me, info at Dr. Robert Silverman .com. Okay, um, I can write it down too in case anyone, if you have questions as well, you can email um, webinars at fullscript.com and I can pass that along as well. Um, again, we will send a recording of this to all, um, anyone who registered and you'll be able to find it on our website at fullscript.com slash webinars. Um, so lots of options to go back and watch this again. And um, if you have any other questions to, to, to send them to the webinars um, email as well. Um, I'm gonna see if there's, looks like uh, a couple of people are asking too um, about the slides availability, but we can kind of discuss that and see if that's something um, we can share or if there's other resources we can share along with this recording. Um, I know there's been some interest in getting them. <laughs> so, we, we, we can get your PDF again, just email me right after and I'll uh, do what I have to. Um, but other than that, it looks like there we've answered most of your questions and it was uh, such an informative presentation that we actually didn't go too much over time. So I want to say thank you again for being here and for everyone for attending today. I know schedules are getting busy, so we appreciate it. And uh, keep an eye out for the recording and let us know if there's any other questions. Great. Look forward to seeing you soon and uh, just email me and I get you all the info you need. Okay. Thanks, uh, Dr. Silverman and everyone take care.